Hello and welcome to this episode of our Europe Chats. Today we're going to talk about a very important institution, the European Council, where the heads of state or government meet at regular intervals to discuss about the future of Europe. The European Council was created, or I should say created itself, about 50 years ago at a summit called by the French President Giscard d'Estaing in December 1974. At this summit, the leaders decided that henceforth they would meet regularly and have their work prepared by the uh, foreign ministers. And ever since, the European Council has played a major role within the European framework. 2024 is also the 50th anniversary of our own organization, TAPSA, with now 49 institutes and universities across the whole of Europe. We have decided to organize a special event to commemorate both anniversaries. And in this context, we've asked our institute members to conduct interviews with former members of the European Council. I'm very honored and pleased today to inaugurate this series of interviews with a very special guest, Herman von Rompe. He is ideally suited to talk to us about the European Council because he was first Prime Minister of Belgium and hence a member of the club uh, among the 27. And then he became the first ever permanent or full-time president of the European Council between 2009 and 2014. Hello, Mr. President, and hello, dear Herman. I'm very pleased that you accepted to talk to us today. My first question is, what were your feelings or your impressions when you first entered the room as a member of the European Council when you were Prime Minister of Belgium? What, how did they receive you? And uh, what did you think about the way the European Council functioned? Mm -hmm. First meeting was an informal European Council in March 2009. Uh, we were in the midst of the financial crisis and, and, and so on, and it was an open conversation. Um, everybody calling the other ones by their first name, which was new for me. Uh, I had to say to uh, the German Chancellor Angela and to the French President Nicolas. Uh, uh, before that, they were very far away from me. I was only three months uh, Prime Minister at that time. Uh, and it, were, it was a meeting only with the heads of state or government. Uh, and I remember that uh, later on, uh, because the second meeting was the regular spring meeting of the European Council, and that was with more than 50 participants. The Minister of Foreign Affairs were also uh, involved in this European Council, and that was a completely different atmosphere. Uh, I will not say that with 28 you have some kind of cozy club, eh? uh, but uh, with uh, more than 50, it, it, it had not that, that charm uh, anymore. Um, so I had two meetings uh, in March 2009, and the other meeting was in, um, in yes, I think in June. In, uh, in June. For me, it was... Uh, it was um, completely new, I had no international experience at all. So I was involved in Belgian politics, I had an interest in international and European affairs, but no experience at all. Um, and, and I tried to learn the job, but you know what happened. Um, I know, yeah. we'll come to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Maybe I should say one word, it's that at the time you entered the European Council, we did not yet have the Lisbon Treaty in function. And that is why you still were with the foreign ministers. But we will come to that in a second. Uh, my next question is about, you know, you represented at this time the national Belgian interests, like everybody else defends their own national interests. How did you perceive this as compared to the European interest? Was there a tension between the two or was it quite natural to work in this way? Uh, it's problem that ha that had to be faced by each prime minister or president uh, uh, but my experience after five years chairmanship of the European Council was that when you enter the room of the European Council you become another person because you know 
that you have to compromise. For a Belgian, it is not that difficult. Mm. Uh, we are a living compromise. Uh, but you, you know, even if you come from a big country, um, even if you have in your own country an absolute majority, you, when you enter the room, you know you have to, to deal with others and, and to find common solutions. So you have to reconcile national interests and European interests. It's the, I would say, I would say the, the essence, the DNA of, of, of the European Council. Is that easy? No. Uh, it's not easy at all. Uh, but there is, there is no other solution. Huh? Uh, when I look at Italy, for instance, now, uh, and with a prime minister coming from a post-fascist party, yes. a complete change yes. once she has participated in the European Council. I say I always say that the European dynamic is even more stro is even stronger than populism. Uh, it's it is transformative being a member of the European Council. Yeah, I think that's a very in important point, and it's something I I always tell students when I talk to them that it's entirely natural for a French president to defend the French interests. That's what he's paid for, but. Within the EU, and particularly in the European Council, we have found a much more intelligent way of defending national interest. But you, you mentioned that you became a president or permanent president of this important club. How did this come about? Uh, this must have been quite a surprise for you at Park. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a story. I have told it um, on not so many occasions. But, but in... In May, so two months after my first uh, participation in the European Council, uh, I received a visit of the Secretary General of, uh, of the Council, um, also your friend, my friend, Pierre de Boissieu. Uh, he came to visit me in, uh, in the residence of the Prime Minister, Belgian Prime Minister, and he said from the very start of his, this conversation, you should be uh, the next or the first president of the European Council. I was in office as prime minister since the end of December. So we were four or five months uh, uh, earlier. Um, we had changed and I let him speak. Uh, and then at the end I said, look, Mr. Secretary General, I'm, I'm very honored. I'm really very honored. But this conversation has never taken place. Uh, so please don't uh, don't speak with others on this. Uh, he made a vi vague promise, um, but I'm not sure that he kept his his word. Uh, and then, for in August, uh, my name was mentioned together with that of Jean Claude Juncker, yes. the uh, Luxembourg Prime Minister, and Jan Peter Balkenende, the, the Dutch Prime Minister. Uh, so it, it's. Um, I, I was not a candidate. I never been really a candidate. Uh, my two colleagues from Luxembourg and Netherlands, they were candidates. Yes. Uh, uh, I was very supported, strongly supported by Nicolas Sarkozy, who convinced, I think, uh, Angela Merkel. Um, but then in November, there was a crucial moment. In November, Frederick Reinfeldt called me. Yes. At that time, uh, rotating president of the, the European Swedish Council. presidency. Yeah, Swedish presidency. And he said, I made uh, a tour of all the capitals, and uh, I think yet that you can become the president of the European Council. He said, again, Frederick, uh, yeah, I'm very honored, but I cannot be missed in this country. The, the government will fall apart the day that I will leave. You're never indispensable but in some moments you are more indispensable than others and this is such a moment um, and that he asked me have you talked about already talked about this with President Sarkozy I said no ten minutes later I, call, I had a call from the Elysee and uh, Sarkozy said don't go in shorts Give me an opportunity to to find out uh, if you uh, can become or not, and I have to promise that when the twenty seven would agree that I would accept. And uh, so that was on Monday, and on Thursday I was elected or appointed. So 
Uh, it's it's a very strange story. It's a very strange story. Uh, where that your friend and colleague Pierre Boissieu, yes, I think, played uh, a major yes. role. Uh, I, I, I was. I may say this now too. I was president at some st- uh, when he for the first time mentioned this to Angela Merkel. Uh, yeah, yeah. And her first reaction then was, "But isn't he needed in Belgium?" Exactly what you said. And then a bit later, she said, "Well, he's needed in Europe." So, yeah, so, I just so for the first it. time that I hear that. No, yes. Now, my next question is how, you know, you, you became president and it was a big surprise for you. Uh, how did you envisage your role as president? And uh, I asked this question because I, I want you to tell us a bit about, you know, how powerful is a president of the European Council or how influential is he? Um, first of all, um, I became president of the European Council. There was nothing, as you know not even in terms of infrastructure, because we had to wait until the Irish voted in favor of the Lisbon exactly. Treaty. So uh, it was nothing really ready uh, to have a president of the European Council. And then normally we, I, we envisage to have four councils in a, in a year's time. Uh, uh, and Angela Merkel asked me, what will you do between two European councils? <laughs> uh, but after a few days, even a few weeks, uh, civil servants of the council came to me and said, look, we have a, a major problem, not very well known or not known at all in, in the public. If we do nothing, Greece will collapse. It was really a shock. And so um, the business as usual scenario uh, was was gone, was gone. Uh, and from from January, we had to work on uh, on taming the, the Greek crisis. I went to, to Athens and then we had in, I think, the 10th of the 11th of February, our first uh, European Council where Greece was at the heart of, 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 of the debate. Uh, so what, what was the role of the, coming back to your question, uh, when I described my role taking office in uh, after rightly after my election, I said we, I am a facilitator, I am a consensus seeker, bridge builder, which was true. But I never thought that we had to do this in crisis times. Uh, and so this, the environment changed dramatically. And as you know, uh, we had to work two years and a half before we could overcome uh, the Eurozone crisis. Uh, and of course, we during the eurozone crisis, we also had to find consensus and 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 and, and to facilitate agreements and and that that's for sure. Uh, but in dramatic circumstances, sometimes you have also to take the lead. Uh, and that was also new in the times of the EU in in this in this history of the EU institutions. In March, the First, the French president and the German chancellor asked me to make a report on the economic governance of the Eurozone. Um, and they, they asked me to organize or to chair a working group with the ministers of finance or, or those responsible for European affairs. So instead of asking the commission, they asked the president of the European Council. And then two years later, um, they asked me to make a report on the on genuine economic and monetary union, which became the, the four presidents' report. Normally also, it was a, a task that had to be assumed by the European Commission. They asked the president of the European Council to do so. So it, it's, I was a, a chairing a meeting. Uh, I was seeking a consensus but I was I became also in some way due to those requests an actor uh, in uh, in in the European Council. So I saw this change. Actually, I saw it from the beginning on. Yeah. No, uh, this is an important point. I mean, the, if you look at the whole history of the European Union, crises are a big driver for change, and they change the role and functions of people, as we've seen over the last years. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, individuals are important, but of course, institutions are also important. And 
it's not the same if you represent France or Luxembourg, I suppose. But uh, uh, how how did you see this? And maybe in this context, you 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 mentioned the Chancellor and the President uh, of France. Uh, obviously, the Franco-German relationship has always been very important in our system. People nowadays have a bit the impression that it's faltering or that it's even a bit kaput, like the Germans would say. What is your take on this? Yeah. In the beginning of my mandate, we spoke about the Mercosi. So this was this abbreviation for the cooperation between uh, Nicolas Sarkozy and, and Angela Merkel. It was so close that they used one name for it, the Mercosi, which was helpful for the functioning of the European Council, but, you know... An, uh, an understanding between France and Germany is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. Uh, and after, after some time, uh, they thought we can do it alone. Uh, and then, then they made also mistakes. Eh? Uh, there's these agreements in what is called Deauville. Eh? Um, we will not go enter into the technical details of it, but that decision they took together was also not helpful at all for uh, overcoming the Eurozone crisis, but they didn't share this with the other members. Uh, uh, and I'm sure if they, if they had put that proposal in the European Council with also the participation of the European Central Bank and others, the president of the Eurogroup, it would, has been another one. Then that uh, came out of their uh, conversations in, in Dauphine. It was about the involvement of the private sector yeah. In, yeah. In, uh, yeah. In, yeah. in financing the needs. In financing me. the needs, yeah. It was technical, but not technical at the same time. Huh? Uh, it, because it had wide-ranging consequences uh, afterwards. Huh? Uh, so this the Franco-German uh, understanding is, is absolutely key and why is it key? Not because uh, they are together, they, they represent half of the economy of the Eurozone at that time, but they represent two cultures in the European Union. The German uh, were being very close to, to the northern part with the Netherlands, uh, Finland, uh, Sweden. Uh, I'm now speaking about the Eurozone, eh? Austria. Uh, and France understanding much better the needs of the, the South, uh, Italy, France, uh, Spain, and, and, and Greece, and so on. They don't belong to those groups, but they are close to each of them. And so when they reach an agreement, it is much more than an agreement between two big economies and, and two major nation states in the European Union. It's a compromise between two cultures. And so the chances that the, you, the, the final agreement is close to their agreement are rather high. Huh? And people forget the, the, this, this culture element uh, in, uh, in, in the functioning of the, 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 European, the European Union. Some are even say that this is some, some kind of compromise between the more Catholic culture and the more Protestant culture. And there is some truth uh, uh, in it. So France and Germany are playing a big role. In my time, uh, first two years, uh, with two uh, very strong leaders in each of the countries, it changed afterwards. Um, and now it's, um, yeah, we, we miss this, uh, this Franco-German motor. Last time it functioned uh, was in May 2020, uh, when uh, President Macron and the uh, um, and Chancellor Merkel agreed on this big initiative, the European Recovery Fund, uh, financed European-wide. Huh? Uh, yes, I will not pronounce the word eurobonds, but that would be too provocative for some. Uh, but it was a major initiative uh, in the beginning of the of the pandemic. But for me, it's really the last time you had this this qualitative step introduced by, uh, by France and Germany. If you have no Franco-German motor, then there is a bigger role for the president of the European Council. He has to fill the gap, so to speak, and had to do this after that Sarkozy left, uh, left office. Um, 
between uh, François Hollande and, and Angela Merkel, there was not the same the same degree of uh, of uh, of understanding and not the same chemistry either. Uh, and so, they, for the Europe, president of the European Council has a bigger role. If not, it's the president of the European Commission. Uh, some, but somebody has to fill the gap to to get things moving in the right direction. Yes, uh, that's a good transition because I wanted to talk a bit about the Commission before that. Uh, uh, what you say about the French and the Germans being different is very important. Uh, Sometimes people say, I mean, how can this work? The French and the Germans disagree on a certain fight. My answer to them is always, I've never seen a fight where the French and the Germans start by agreeing with each other. It's important that, but they have the political will to overcome it. And that's what today is a bit more missing. And the meeting you mentioned uh, uh, between Macron and Merkel was in Meseberg in the north of uh, uh, Berlin on the 18th of May. It allowed the commission to be very ambitious in their proposal for a new fund. And that brings me to the commission. What what is your feeling? What's the importance of the presence of the commission in the meetings? And maybe if you can also say a word more generally about cooperation with other institutions, uh, the commission mainly, but also the European Parliament or the Eurogroup. First of all, the, uh, the level of persons, because that is also important. Uh, so when I took office, in the Belgian tradition of talking to each other, I said to my colleague, uh, José Manuel Barroso, we will see each other every week on Monday, the beginning of the working week. And we will put everything on the table, uh, knowing what uh, each role is. Uh, I was completely new and no experience at all. Uh, Barroso had been prime minister, minister of foreign affairs for during years. He was he had the first uh, mandate as president of the European Commission, so I wanted also to learn uh, from him. Um, so we we had that we had that close cooperation. I'm quoting now the the, the, the Lisbon Treaty. Uh, uh, we had that close cooperation, being totally different as personalities. We were closely together, and, and this was very helpful too for the rest of my mandate. In some way, it's a template for uh, for successors. Uh, and of course, each had its own role, huh? uh, and we had to respect also each other. Uh, when the leaders asked me to draft a report, for instance, on genuine economic and monetary union, my first reaction was yes, but in close cooperation with the president of the European Commission, member of the European Council, by the way. The Commission has 30,000, more than 30,000 uh, uh, personnel, of civil servants, highly qualified. So they are, they are able to introduce new ideas. And when the decision is taken by the European Council, they have the means to implement it. So and they, they have this monopoly of legislative proposals. Uh, so th th it's their role to be creative and to launch ideas, uh, and if in any case they have to implement them, uh, so the, the the commission is absolutely a, a key institution. But I'm now saying is a commonplace. Uh, uh, but as president of the European Council, I fully acknowledge that I cannot work without the commission. I will not work against the commission, even in, in the European Council. Uh, this this let, let's say the. They, they have another approach. The European Council, as you said, is more driven by the sum of 27 to of 28 national interests, although I have to put a nuance to this. Uh, I mean, when you enter the room of the European Council, you become different, but let's, let's, let's make a caricature, a shortcut, and say they are more, in the first place, driven by national interest, but the European Commission is not driven by by that, they are driven by the by the European uh, by the European interest. I have to nuance also the role of the Commission because they say the Commission is independent. Yes, but first of all, they are dependent from the European Parliament. They have to get the confidence of the European Parliament. 
And of course, the European Council. And of course, place. the European <laughs> Council. <laughs> yeah. uh, because when they have a proposal, uh, they are not working in a political vacuum. Yeah. They have uh, to, to look also at what is possible and what is not possible. Uh, so being independent doesn't mean that, that you are welt fremd and that, that you are out of, of the reality, political realities of the member states or the European Parliament. Uh, you have to take into account all those different sensitivities uh, because the aim is to, to make progress and to, to, uh, that some proposals that are badly needed uh, get finally a consent in the European Union. Mm. My philosophy, working with the Commission, working with the Parliament, working with others, was we are not rivals. We have a common interest, the European interest. Um, don't forget that we were in the midst of an unprecedented crisis, the Eurozone crisis. If we had not succeeded, there would not have been a European Union anymore. It's not only... We were fighting not only for a, a, a currency, which is important, but we are fighting, as Angela Merkel once said, we are fighting for the, the, the very existence of the European Union. So in that perspective, we are not rivals. We have a common interest, we have a common goal. Yes, and I think the, the secret of the European Union is the interplay between the various uh, 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 institutions which are based on different legitimacies. The European Parliament is directly elected by the citizens, but all the members of the European Council are elected by their national electorate. And what you said about the uh, European Council is, of course, true that the European Council, according to the treaty even, in the Lisbon Treaty now, according to Article 15 of the TEU, has the is in charge of setting the political direction for all the institutions. So there is a very natural link between the two. But the Commission has the right of initiative, is the guardian of the treaties, and has some executive functions. 